Well, I, I can hardly say what a special pleasure it is to welcome <laughs> all of you to this room because there is so much shared history here, decades of it. We're not going to count that. <laughs> but, um, but this is an incredible reunion, uh, among other things. So thank you all for being interested. Thank you all for being here with us, um, and welcome. Uh, my name is Doris Meissner, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Migration Policy Institute. And I am particularly pleased, personally as well as on behalf of MPI, to um, host this session today uh, on the publication of Charles's book, um, which, as you know, is called Immigration Reform, The Corpse That Will Not Die. But we've tried to give this session a little bit of an even more provocative title, uh, which is to say the question is, will immigration reform ever succeed again? The legacy of IRCA and its enduring lessons. So um, <clears throat> uh, MPI, of course, as you may well know, has been Charles's home while he's been writing this book. And uh, he's been a resident fellow here uh, on a partial sabbatical from his day job. At, uh, uh, as one of the senior people at UNIOS US, but that has had hiccups because it started actually in about 2012. I think all of us thought, most importantly probably Charles, that this project would finish before that time, but all kinds of day job things came up along the way that have to do with events that many of us have participated in, et cetera. Um, and you know, as so often is the case with things like this, even though you think, oh my God, it should have been done, or it's the time will have passed, or whatever, the time doesn't ever seem to pass for these kinds of things to actually be relevant. So even though this took maybe longer than expected, it's highly relevant. And we're very pleased to have had Charles be with us, and very pleased, as I say, to be able to now be talking about it, and talking about it with a much wider audience. Um, also here at the table, of course, you know my colleague Mushishti, who is um, the director of MPI's office at NYU, and um, um, and the three of us, but mostly Charles and, and uh, Moose, will try to get us off the ground in terms of so many things that are talked about in this book. Now, um, I do want to announce that we're live streaming this event. And so I, of course, am also welcoming any uh, online viewers. We would want you to know that people can tweet questions to at Migration Policy or use the hashtag MPI Discuss, or you can email to events at migrationpolicy.org. And so with that, I'm going to start us off by saying that Moose is going to be what we think of as our scene setter today. And Moose is our scene setter because in addition to the work that he does now, which all of us continue to be familiar with, he was a key player uh, during the time, life and times <laughs> of pre-Urca, Urca, and post-Urca uh, as a person deeply involved in the American labor union movement. And um, that, of course, was a very critical constituency. He also is one of our best immigration historians as a side interest. And so he's going to start us off um, by basically answering the question, Moose, what do we need to know? What should people know about the lead up to IRCA that is important in order for Charles to actually get into the IRCA story itself? Uh, thank you, Doris. First of all, what a collection of warriors uh, here. I could say this is the Normandy re reunion without the, uh, without the badges or the founding uh, meeting of the forum without the smoke-filled room. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm also just not speaking as a uh, behalf of MPI, but as one of the members of the, that, of the group that uh, Senator Simpson would not endearingly call us. Uh, but all I can tell you as a member of the group, all of us have salivated to write about Erka. But even from the very beginning, I always knew that the only person among us who actually had the best insight and the best discipline to write this book would be Charles. Uh, 
and it's not a surprise that Charles did it. So Charles, thank you so much for doing it on behalf of the group, on behalf of uh, students of history, which will relish, I think, every detail of this book. So Urca clearly was a moment in history. But as we like to say at MPI, even history needs a little bit of history. Uh, so let's just recount how we got to Urca. Uh, just quickly, we all know there were no immigration laws in our country at the federal level until 1882. In 1882, Congress for the first time established qualitative limits for immigration. There are certain kinds of people we don't like. Then, and only in 1924, beginning 21, formalized in 24, did we establish quantitative limits on immigration. And that was basically to preserve uh, northern and western supremacy in our immigration streams, essentially against eastern and southern Europeans. And that remained our law until 1965. It was only in 1965, in the historic Immigration Act of 65, that Congress got rid of the National Origin Quota System. We all celebrate that as one of the most momentous events in our history. It changed the face of America. Just to be clear, in 1965, only 267,000 people came to the United States as green card holders. In the last 10 years, every year, 1.1 million people have come as green card holders. Just to make clear, at that time, the foreign-born population of the United States was only about 9.6 million. Today, it's close to 45 million. Just to be clear, in 1965, 85% of our immigration was European. Today, 85% of our immigration is non-European. So by all accounts, it was a hugely uh, important, momentous event and to be celebrated. But it did have a very strange, unintended consequence, which was not appreciated at that time. One is that many of you don't realize that till 1965, there were actually no limits on people from the Western Hemisphere to come to the United States. So countries like Mexico, there were no limits as long as they passed the qualitative limit, which was the public charge requirement that kept most Mexicans out. It was only in 65 that we included Mexico in the West Western Hemisphere and became part of the quota system. So suddenly, you had Mexicans who were coming unlimited numbers. Their avenues for coming for legal immigration for permanent residents were suddenly curtailed. A parallel development happened in 1964 when Congress ended the Bracero program. It was a program that had operated from 1946 to 1964. About 4.6 million Mexican workers came during that time. In the high point in 1956, about 445 Mexicans came through the Bracero program. 445,000. Sorry, 45,000 people came in this million. Uh, so, so you can imagine that both the end of the avenues for permanent immigration and the end of avenue for temporary migration, suddenly you had lost a lot of most important avenues for Mexican migration. And the unauthorized migration from Mexico started, and by 1972, it had become a highly pronounced phenomenon. Members of Congress were noticing it, executive branches were noticing it. Just to give you another sort of figure, in 1972, uh, we apprehended about 500,000 people at the Mexican border every year, uh, in that year. By 1986, that number had gone to 1.7 million people apprehended every year. So you knew that the unauthorized phenomenon was becoming a suddenly a very both uh, factual uh, at the you know at the factual level a big number, but at the political level is obviously a highly noticed phenomenon. So, in August of '77, to his credit, with huge contribution, I'm sure at that point for, from Doris, President Carter sent a bill to Congress to address the issue of unauthorized migration. It asked for sanctions on employers, asked for legalization, and a border security reform. And Congress took no action, didn't even give a hearing. Senator Eastland, who has come a lot in the news recently, I'm not going to call him a segregationist here, but he was certainly, uh, he was certainly an agricultural farmer. He had strong interests with agricultural uh, lobby, and he never gave the bill even a hearing. But in the classic sort of Senator Edward Kennedy maneuver, he steered out of Eastland a provision to create 
a new Blue Ribbon Commission called the Select Commission on Migration and Refugee Policy. A highly credible, high-profile commission was established with four leaders from the Congress, four cabinet members, and four public members, headed by Father Ted Hesburg, who was then the president of the Notre Dame and had huge gravitas in the United States in many sectors. It was only in February of 1981 that the Select Commission presented its report. Biden President Reagan had become president. Many of us who were then part of this group were skeptical whether Reagan would ever endorse a program like this. To his credit, President Reagan quickly endorsed the broad structure of the, of the Select Commission's recommendation. So much so that in March of 1982, a senator called Alan Simpson from Wyoming and a congressman called Ramon Rizzoli from Kentucky introduced the simpson Mazzoli bill. It failed in 1982. It again failed in 1984. And then suddenly it revived in 1986. By then, they recognized the important accommodation had to be made to the agricultural interests. And that having been made, the miracle of the revival of the 1986 happened. The miracle was so well represented in a highly quoted statement by Dan Lundgren, then a congressman from California, who said the corpse was on its way to the morgue and the toes suddenly started twitching and we gave it CPR. That's the byline of Charles's book, that the corpse will not die. So suddenly in October of 1986, uh, both uh, houses passed the, passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act. President Reagan signed it three weeks later and a historic moment was born. The three elements of uh, IRCA were famously uh, labeled by Senator Simpson as the three-legged stool. I think Senator Simpson loved calling it the three-legged stool. There must have been a favorite piece of furniture in Wyoming. Uh, but he, the three legs of the stool were, uh, were border security enhancements, employer sanctions, civil and criminal penalties against unauthorized workers, and a one-time only clean the slate legalization for the unauthorized people at that time. Now, you know, the three-legged stool has actually intrigued me quite a bit when I thought about this. There are two things about that which I just want to note. One is that they may look like very trivial three legs today. They were huge events at that time. I mean, to think that we would actually get employer sanctions, which was considered almost anathema in a capitalist society, that in a capitalist society, laissez faire system should work. It's almost the birthright of capitalists to hire anyone that they want. To end that as a US norm was a big deal. Secondly, to give amnesty to people. I mean, Cardinal Bevilacqua, who became Cardinal of, of uh, Philadelphia before he died, told me this himself, that the first hearing in 1972 before Peter Rodino's committee, he asked, he was then a father in, in, of a church in Brooklyn, he asked him, so, Father, what should we do with this unauthorized population? And Rudino's and Bevilacqua said, I think we should give them complete amnesty. And Rudino laughed. He said, we can't do that kind of stuff in the country. Come on, give me something better. So to, to see that these big sort of sacred cows were suddenly swallowed in the Urca debate is now, in historic terms, very hard to fathom. The last thing I want to say is that oddly, the three-legged stool was exactly the same three-legged stool, without calling it that, that poor President Carter had sent to Congress in August of 1977. So you could say, why did the three-legged stool proposed by Carter not win, but one that came in Reagan presidency win? You could argue that it takes some president like Reagan to make something like this happen. Other people have argued that Reagan was the last president we had who could not only tell members of his own party what to do, but members of the, upper, the other party also what to do. Or you could say that it needed a high-profile, credible select commission to give it the, the seat of approval that it needed. And I think that's what Charles is going to tell us. Thank you. disagreeing with Moose, but um, <laughs> it's never happened before. <laughs> it happened last night at dinner. Um, I'll actually have something else to say about uh, President Reagan, but let me just start with a caveat that um, although I am proud to be employed at Unidos US and I'm an 
MPI fellow, I speak for neither. Um, I am often struck by how many otherwise informed people know so little about IRCA. Um, it's often called the Reagan amnesty bill, and to disagree a bit with Moose, but his administration was internally divided about the legislation throughout its entire path, was generally hostile to the idea of legalizing undocumented people, and played a minimal role in its passage other than endorsing the bill at the beginning and signing the bill at the end. Many people blame IRCA for the growth of the unauthorized population since then, but that growth actually accelerated most rapidly after passage by the GOP Congress of a tough enforcement-only bill in 1996, 10 years after IRCA was enacted. Because it successfully legalized 3 million people, people uh, many people assume that it must have been supported by Latinos and progressives and opposed by conservatives, when the reality is far different. In fact, one of the early working titles for the book, uh, thankfully discarded, was When Hispanics Opposed Immigration Reform. And I suspect my publisher would not want me to say this. Robert, I hope you're not watching. Um, but anyone looking for a solution to our immigration policy impasse in via a quick fix or a recipe short enough to fit in a single form, short form news article or a formula that can be communicated in a 140 character tweet, although I guess you now get to do, what, 280? Mm -hmm. um, you won't find it in this book. Uh, this book is an old-fashioned book, and not just because I'm kind of an old-fashioned guy, but it's full of details because the details matter. It's full of lengthy portrayals of people because people matter. It tells the story of how the IRCA became law through every major procedural step because when it comes to legislation, the process matters. And be, it covers the, bill impl the bill's implementation, not because that matters too, because it does, but because the battle lines of today's immigration debate were literally being drawn as IRCA was being implemented. So this book, as Doris says, about the life and times of the Immigration Reform and Control Act uh, was undoubtedly consequential. And to understand how it came to be, uh, one can start with one of the greatest, most influential political scientists of the modern era, a guy named John Kingdon. <laughs> Any of you who've studied, gone to public policy school have read his books. He said, in order for major reforms to be enacted, you had to have three Ps, the convergence of three streams, a recognized problem stream, a mature policy stream, and a third stream, which he always had a little bit of trouble defining, called political will. And when it comes to immigration, the problem stream of unauthorized migration, a policy stream of reforms to address it, and sufficient political will to move it through at least one house of Congress has existed a dozen times uh, in the last 50 years. But it's only in 1986, and again with a follow-on bill in 1990, did that Congress actually enacted reform. So the question arises, what was different about that period? And I think one of the answers to that question is lies in the detail and the people and the process described in the book, uh, because um, you need to understand that policy is made not just through the problem, policy, and politics stream, but that people and process also matter. And it is the interaction of all five of those Ps, as it were, that produces legislation. Uh, when I first came to D.C. in 1982, I think the onboarding process at then the National Council of La Raza was they gave me a book. It was called, I think, 
The Intern's Guide <coughs> to Capitol Hill. And in that book, there's this chart. And it's how a bill becomes law. And it was kind of two kind of blocks. And you know, the, the House, there's in the House and the Senate, you have a subcommittee, and they have to move it. And then a full committee. And then um, the floor in both houses. And then they come together, right, with a conference committee. And then both houses have to pass the bill again, the conference report, and then it gets signed by the president, and then it gets filtered off into all these other agencies to be implemented. And while it's extraordinarily helpful to have that chart, especially for me, it's also wildly deceiving because the legislative process is not linear. It just doesn't work that way, which is one of the reasons why the introduction to my book begins with a metaphor recounted by Mort Halperin um, actually, one of the very last interviews I did for the book was with Mort, and he gave me this anecdote, and I said, that's my introduction. So let me quote, uh, Washington is like a roaring river, Mort said, and in the river there are thousands of logs, each one a different policy idea, and on each log there are thousands of ants. Most logs break apart. Some wash ashore or get stuck in a log jam. Every once in a while, a log makes it all the way to the sea. And every ant on that log thinks she's the one who steered it there. <laughs> <laughs> the stories in my book ex attempt to explain how the logs that later became IRCA and the Immigration Act of 1990 made it all the way to the ocean. And we should start with a proposition that as a general proposition, passing laws is really hard. Big bills, big bills are really, really hard. Big bills that expose ideological or partisan fault lines are really, really hard. You get where I'm going here. Um, when you add race, when you add questions of American identity, right, you've got to add more reallys to the line. This is not a big secret. Uh, as far back as the 15th century, perhaps the modern political scientist uh, Machiavelli um, s stated as much. It's always harder to pass something than to stop something. And in the 20th century, uh, a famed political scientist named Aaron Woldavsky, only people of my generation will remember who that is, um, first applied the laws of probability to public policy and calculated that just to get to implementation, just the 11 steps you need to get there, um, once you, a bill starts a markup, your chances are 8%. And here's the big secret. Most bills never get a hearing, much less a markup. So since the vast majority of bills never get the hearing, most of them are doomed. They are dead on arrival, or corpses in the vernacular. In the vernacular. So the simple fact that IRCA and its follow-on bill actually passed, and some of its provisions worked exactly as intended, others did not, uh, are important achievements in and of themselves. And the lawmakers involved, and Moose mentioned many of them, deserve much kudos. Uh, but unlike the standard le legislative chronicle in which those lawmakers are the, are the protagonists, uh, this book is told from the perspective of a small group of advocates that, as Moose articulated, called itself the group. We were the ants on the log in Halperin's metaphor. Some of the members of the group are in this room, and I won't necessarily go through all of them, because I would not be able to stop talking about some of them. Um, and I would just say, as a group, uh, we faced enormously enormous policy challenges. We wanted to defeat or mitigate employer sanctions, which, which Ron Mazzoli the House sponsor called the heart of the bill. We saw a far more generous legalization program than the, say, one million who might have been authorized under the original bill. 
instead of reducing family-based immigration, which the original IRCA would have done, we wanted to increase it. The group opposed greater restrictions on asylum seekers that the original bill included. The group wanted to prevent the creation of a major agricultural guest worker program that was not, I would note, in the original, book, in the original bill, but passed the House in 1984 and the Senate in 1985. Some in the group were demanding protections from deportation for Salvadorans fleeing massive civil strife in Central America. Some of them also hoped to force policymakers, or at least to begin a discussion among policymakers, about addressing the push factors in immigration source countries. <coughs> Although, honestly, none of us had a clue about what that actually might be. Some, um, Rick Swartz and Phyllis Eisen in particular, who are both here, also envisioned a building a whole new powerful field of pro-immigrant and Latino advocates in the process. And the group began by committing to oppose legislation that did not include these policy goals. The group had precious few resources, especially because the powerful Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, the preeminent voice for minorities, um, sat out the debate. And it sat it out because its most powerful members, the NAACP and organized labor, with one or two exceptions, Moose was one of them, the union he worked for was one of them, supported the bill, as did virtually every other progressive group in Washington, as did virtually every editorial board in the country. The group's resources were dwarfed by virtually every other interest, agriculture, labor, big business, and an emerging small network of organizations that later grew into a massive conglomerate called FAIR. Almost all of the Latino organizations, LULAC, MALDEF, and NCLR, were literally teetering on the edge of bankruptcy throughout the entire debate. And if you talk about public opinion polls, almost uniformly, each of the group's public policy objectives were far less popular than they are today. And yet, while the advocates couldn't stop employer sanctions, uh, they succeeded almost everywhere else. IRCA did not include a major agricultural guest worker program. It resulted in nearly 3 million undocumented people becoming lawful permanent residents of the US. It extended administrative and eventually permanent protection from deportation for perhaps another million close family members of those legalized. It eventually, together with the 1990 Act, doubled legal immigration from its current levels. It kept the asylum system largely intact. And in 1990, through something called TPS and some unrelated measures I need to note, like successful litigation and, and legislation known as NACARA, uh, provided relief for perhaps another 800,000. I would honestly had tried but couldn't quite get to the right number there, but perhaps another 800,000 Central Americans fleeing civil strife or natural disaster in their home country. And I think except for the exclusion of a large temporary worker program, I don't believe anyone would have guessed. No one would certainly have predicted that any of these outcomes would have occurred at the beginning of the debate. So one might ask, how did the group do it? And for that answer, you have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but while I hope the book does have some value as strictly an historical document, I think our discussion today is, do any of those lessons from that era have any relevance uh, to the current era? And I am mindful that those of us of a certain age have to consciously avoid starting every sentence with, well, back in the day, the way we did it. <laughs> Um, but the book does close in its final chapter with a number of suggestions, um, which I hope are useful for the next generation <laughs> of reformers. I would say the first of those is that in retrospect, the group actively defied conventional wisdom at every turn in almost every way. 
and I have two pages of bullets of <laughs> anecdotes from the book to um, identify those. Um, none of these maneuvers, and they were pretty much all unorthodox at the time, were planned, if you think about a plan in a linear, traditional fashion. But in many respects, they were planned for sometimes weeks, sometimes months, often years in advance. Because the second lesson about the Urca era is how the group and its allies and lawmakers in Congress, in certain cases, viewed the legislative process. It didn't view the process as linear. It viewed it much more like Halperin's metaphor of a chaotic river with rapid currents. They saw it more like a market, a political economy, if you will. Um, and because policy entrepreneurs, to succeed in any, any economy, need, need to collect massive amounts of data, we collected massive amounts of data, including occasionally by having discussions with our opponents. And while I guarantee you none of us at the time had heard of anything resembling what's now called chaos theory, I think it's fair to say we approached our craft in much the same way that chaos theorists today study any complex system like, say, the weather. Uh, the group anticipated multiple different scenarios. Uh, weather, forecast by the, weather forecasters, by the way, call this ensemble forecasting, where you use computer models and you change a variable in each one, and they tell you uh, different scenarios that might happen and then tried to plant seeds of tactics that might work under each of those scenarios as the opportunity arose. And I would just note that we were very close and highly coordinated, but we were decidedly not on the same page. It might be said that the group deployed multiple strategies simultaneously, including some that were internally inconsistent. The third lesson I would note is that at pivotal moments, key lawmakers made enormous concessions to their opposition. And again, I highlight a number of those examples in the book. And, and, and I don't argue that any of these strategies pursued by either lawmakers or advocates way back in the day has a specific application to today's debate. But I do think that a different mindset among today's reformers might be helpful. That mindset, among other things, might include a willingness to dispense with conventional wisdom that pretty much always says every big bill is dead on arrival. Um, another lesson is to talk with people on the other side of the issue and to communicate your message beyond your base. At various points, one must be willing, if one wants a, a, a result, to break with partisan orthodoxy. I think, but most of all, it's important to not be bound by the current political landscape, but to try and imagine not just a different future, but several different futures. And for that, just like, think of what's happened in the last dozen years. In 2006, the, House, the Senate passed a bill, the House refused to act. In 2007, the bill dies on the Senate floor when, with new Speaker Nancy Pelosi, she, I guarantee you, could have produced a bill on the other side. In 2010, the House passes the DREAM Act, it dies in the Senate. Three years later, the Senate passes a bill, it's never brought up to a vote in the House. I know, and because I hear this all the time, most look at that record and see failure. And believe me, I feel it some myself. But looking at it from the way a historian might look at that period, it looks a lot like the dozen years or so that preceded Urca's passage. And believe me, this is coming from a guy who tends to be on the more glass half empty than glass <laughs> half full perspective. Let me just close on this note. Um, upon assuming office after the assassination of President Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson made it clear to his aides that he, quote, wanted nothing to do with immigration. 
two years later, he was at the base of the Statue of Liberty, signing the Immigration Act of 1965 into law. In 1975, the new Immigration Subcommittee, 1979, I'm sorry, new Immigration Subcommittee uh, Chair Al Simpson half joked that he was thrown into the issue, forced to join the Select Commission because no one else wanted the job. Uh, experts who've written, in fact, there's a Irving Shapiro's wonderful book called The Last Great Senate, uh, lamented that the era of bipartisanship in Congress ended with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. In 1982, new immigration um, subcommittee, or actually 1981, uh, new immigration subcommittee chair Ron Mazzoli said he had to virtually Shanghai or beg people to join his subcommittee. In mid-October 1986, after his bill died on the House floor, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Rodino told, told his aides he was now ready to wash his hands of the bill. As Moose pointed out, at that, that same week, ranking subcommittee member Dan Lundgren called the bill a corpse. And just three weeks later, Simpson, Mazzoli, Rodino, and Lundgren watched as President Reagan signed that corpse into law. So thank you, and I'd be happy to answer questions. <laughs> Charles, that was great. But um, before we go to the audience for questions, uh, let me try to pull out a couple of things from what you've said, because You've given us some tantalizing stuff here without really doing Clever the home me, run. Eh? <laughs> doing the home run. So a couple of things you in your takeaways, you talked about a whole set of unorthodox maneuvers that the group engaged in. I, I, I take it some of it consciously, some of it just by inexperience and the 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 you know demands of the time, but whatever they would be. And that there also were some enormous concessions that were made by members of Congress and key sponsors. Can, can you give us an example or two of those maneuvers and an example or two of those concessions? Sure. Um, so one of the um, standard rules when you learn, I was probably in that intern's guide to Washington when I first uh, came to DC, um, was that you have filibusters in the Senate, but you don't have filibusters in the House. Uh, but in 1990, Two, after the bill had passed the Senate, um, some members of the group cleverly lobbied for an open rule, and the bill died on the House floor in what many called a filibuster by amendment. Um, and there's a lot more to that. But um, uh, just before the bill went to the House floor in 1984, not to step back, there was a very consequential primary in the state of Texas uh, where a, um, uh, that was eventually won by Phil Graham, the Republican, actually Republic, uh, Democrat turned Republican. Uh, but in that primary, an almost unknown congressman, congressman named Kent Hance went from nowhere to the top of the polls by campaigning incessantly against amnesty. So much so that many members of the Texas delegation who were inclined to support legalization were beginning to walk away from it. And in, I think, a previously unreported secret deal, uh, Majority Leader Jim Wright called some of us into his office and said, he had the idea to save legalization. It was going to be by requiring people to learn English or pass or be enrolled in a course. Does that sound familiar? Um, and without the idea ever having been debated or mentioned in any other forum previous to that, that was written in to the House bill, and it prevailed. Um, in 1984, also that year, um, the League of United Latin American Citizens, after the bill passed the House, and um, Rick Swartz was among those who went to the Democratic National Convention, um, demanded a first ballot boycott of Latino dele Mondale delegates 
because he had failed to oppose the bill sufficiently hard enough. Um, so there were any number of what I think most people would have assumed were highly unorthodox maneuvers um, that I think made a difference in the final outcome. Maybe the last one I would mention, since so many people involved in that debate, the Mokley Deconcini debate that ended up being uh, TPS, is um, the Mokley Deconcini bill never actually made it through the, the, the committees of jurisdiction. Um, it was they were passed through the Rules Committee in the House. Why? Because Joe Mokley was the chairman of the rule of a Rules Subcommittee, not even yet chairman of the of the full committee. Um, and while no one thought you would actually move a bill through the Rules Committee, Joe Mokley asked the question, "Why not?" And while it was ultimately stricken from the 1986 bill, it was resurrected in the 1990 bill. And how about big compromises that members make? Um, you know, there were many, and um, Senator Simpson used to say that he would, um, that when he would see us coming down the hall, that uh, here come the groups, they're about to cut my bicycle tires again. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would maybe mention two or three, uh, which were really unusual at the time. So um, the original bill was the Simpson-Mazzoli bill that Muzaffar noted. Um, in 1985, um, Representative Mazzoli, who was a centrist Democrat, who was, had ruffled many partisan feathers, um, happened to vote wrong, quote unquote, on a completely unrelated matter, having to do with a whether to seat um, a member of Congress. Um, and he voted with the Republicans uh, to demand a do-over election. The uh, district was the Indiana 8th Congressional District called the Bloody 8th. Um, and among others, uh, Jim Wright, who was then the majority leader and the future Speaker of the House, made it known that if his name was on the bill, that bill was not going anywhere. And in an extraordinarily selfless act, and I got to tell you, I didn't, M Mr. Mazzoli was not friendly with us, and we were not friendly with him at the time, and it's only with the, I think, distance of history, but in, a, in quite an extraordinary selfless act, he went to Peter Rodino, who himself he had a very difficult relationship with, and asked him to sponsor his bill, the bill he had moved through the House um, once and, and nearly twice. Uh, in 1986, I think the unsung hero of, of this story is um, a uh, two-term congressman, congressman named Esteban Torres from California broke with his elders in the Hispanic Caucus to lead a moderate faction that worked very closely with the group uh, and negotiated not with Rodino but with Mazzoli who had by then been shunted off to the side to negotiate a number of compromises that ultimately ended up in the bill. And I remember a, a saying, I'm sorry, I, this is why I tried to keep it brief at the beginning. No, 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 but this um, is what it comes to. My down boss to. used to say to me all the time, um, my former boss, Raul Izaguirre, uh, whenever I would, and I would say these things pretty frequently when somebody was down, eh, you can ignore them, you know, kick them off, kick them over to the curb. And he always had this Washington phrase called, always stay in with the outs. Because at some point, the outs are going to be back in again. And uh, Mr. Torres, um, who did not have much stature in the Hispanic Caucus, thought he saw a kindred spirit in Mr. Mazzoli and ultimately negotiated a number of the key compromises that led to the bill. And maybe mention one last one. Uh, the special agricultural worker program that most mentioned that um, Congressman Berman and um, Panetta and uh, Chuck Schumer uh, negotiated in place a legalization program for agriculture in place of a temporary worker program was considered a bridge too far by pretty much everybody in the debate. And in October 1986, First Simpson, then Mazzoli, then Dan Lundgren, 
then the Reagan administration uh, had to swallow hard and accept that compromise as the price for accepting a bill. Um, look, I think they made the right choice. It legalized a million people, uh, former farm workers. But that was not an easy choice for conservative Republicans to make. Those are great examples. And what they really point to is one of the real threads in this book, and that is how much the personalities matter. That you know, you can talk all you want to about all the big themes and all the moments in history and everything else. It does come down to the people, and it comes down to the people and their quirks as well as their um, relationships and what they need. That uh, as politicians, and um, that texture and that granularity um, ultimately does tell the story in the way that you have experienced it and, and, and do this book. Indeed, and I'm sorry I have to uh, indulge me on this. So one of our sources of intelligence was what many people today would view as gossip. Um, Phyllis Eisen, who is here, held a monthly lunch with immigration experts, with, with women immigration experts on Capitol Hill. And believe me, there weren't that many of them. And I would also say that almost nobody paid attention to them because they were women. They included people on the, uh, Karen on the Ed, Ed and Labor Committee, Joyce at the Congressional Research Service. I think Doris was in some of those meetings. Antonia, I mean, I'm not sure who. Well, I, I didn't get to go. I didn't get to go to the women's lunches. Um, but where, what we would learn about them, and I say this, I can't remember exactly the way I said this in the book, but it wasn't just that we knew about their. We we knew about many members of Congress, not just their policy positions, but their affairs, extramarital or otherwise. And those things made a difference when we're trying to decide how we're we going to handle this. And I, I distinctly remember one or two times where we'd say, well, we're going to get this guy and this guy, and they're going to join together and sponsor this amendment. And Phyllis said, you know, hold on a second. You know, that guy's wife was having an affair with this guy, <laughs> um, and you better not go there. And I think it's that <clears throat> granularity. These were not their Twitter messages. These were real human beings that we had to <coughs> deal with. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there is um, so much resident knowledge in this room that I want to get to the audience Q&A. But I also do want to tell you that we're not clearly going to be able to finish on all the topics that are possible. And so please all do stay for a reception that we're having afterwards. It's on the first floor. Um, there will be food and drink and obviously good people. So we. When we do close, we'll hope to continue the conversation. But before I go to the audience, I do have to try to do a slightly bigger picture question here for both of you to comment on. And uh, that is, you know, ultimately, why is this important today? What is the legacy of IRCA? Would you, respectively, call IRCA a success or a failure? If you think about success, certainly 3 million people were legalized. The fact that legislation actually happened was important. The um, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, effort to put money into the immigration system, work on employer enforcement, all those sorts of things were landmarks at the time. But when you listen to your list of issues, they are all the same issues that we are still debating today. So on the failure side, if you think of IRCA, what was really resolved? Are these just enduring, ongoing issues that are going to always be part of a country that is an immigrant nation in a globalized world? Um, what do you think of IRCA? Success or failure? You start. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you, you drew this thing about the same issues. I mean, you could really say that the three-legged stool today is still the center of exactly. our debate. And it's the center of the answers I mean, it's still a three-legged stool with a big Christmas tree around it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you could actually call the present CIR debate. Uh, but you know, as all historic legislation, it has pluses and minuses. Even great legislation has some minuses. I would say on the positive side, you just cannot ignore 
that it brought three million people out of the shadows into the sunshine. Mm -hmm. I mean, just in the how much it mattered in the lives of those people and those of us who had actually had to work on the implementation, how we saw that on a daily basis, that people's lives changed. You just, there's no price you can pay uh, attached to that. Not to mention that it gave then rise to them sponsoring other relatives, which then led to the big growth in our legal immigration that we see today. On this, I particularly want to say how much it led to the growth of Mexican immigration to the United States. 70% of people who got legalized were Mexicans. The fact that you had a Mexican sort of big explosion in the population then is not a small thing. And one of Charles's sort of subtexts of this book is the rise of the Latino power. And you could say that Erka was directly responsible for the rise of the Latino power. Uh, I mean, to me, the, the lessons from this uh, was that it actually also creates, strangely created the core of the present unauthorized population. That the way the, the, the eligibility rules were that you had to have been here at least five years before you got legalized. That means large number of people who were in the country in 1987 did not get legalized. That you could say was the, is sort of the responsible for the present core. Uh, but to me, the lasting uh, legacy of IRCA was that it failed to recognize the dynamics of a labor market, uh, that it might have sort of cleaned the slate for the present unauthorized. It did not predict the need for future labor needs of the country, which then also created the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the growth of the unauthorized because if people could not find uh, legal channels to come to meet the labor market demand, they use the legal channels. Okay, Charles, you, I'd like to have you answer that question uh, and I'm please. going to add one, <coughs> one uh, small detail, <laughs> quote unquote, to it, which is among the big issues in passing IRCA was the promise, explicitly stated as a promise, that never again would the Congress engage in an amnesty. And the, 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 the enduring resonance of that particular part of the debate vis-a-vis -vis success, failure, um, what would you have to say about that as having, having looked at it so carefully? Um, and here maybe I'm moving a little bit off my author hat and a little bit more on my advocate's hat. I, I would also say the proponents of employer sanctions said it would stop undocumented migration. Um, and that didn't stop the GOP Congress a decade later from passing enforcement-only legislation that they said was going to stop unauthorized migration. So I think there's a little bit of a, um, a it's a little bit of an unfair question to expect, or an un unfair expectation that any bill is going to solve these huge societal problems. I mean, by this standard were the civil rights bills of the 1960s and Brown v. Board failures because there's still significant segregation and discrimination in this country? I don't think so. They weren't perfect. Um, and then I think on your last question, you know, it was only one time and therefore you can never revisit it. Well, you know, some of us were maybe said it was only going to be one time. Well, you know, it's the future generation that will have to deal with that question. I think the, the best answer was Mort Halpern is, again, quoted in my book. Because I asked him in, uh, in an interview, come on, Mort, did you really think that temporary protected status was really temporary? And Mort was very matter of fact. He said, no, nah, I didn't think was, they would necessarily all go back. But you know what? Then the next time it came up, if their lives were still endangered, we were going to protect them again. And then if the temporary status came up again and Central America was still in civil war, we were going to protect them again. Um, so I get the notion that in that time, I think people in good faith made the commitment that it was a one-time only program. Um, but times have changed. Well, that actually does go to the point uh, when, you, when you say, <clears throat> should any big 
policy action be considered sorry, a successor? Can I, can I ask one, one, one answer? And this is where I, in the book, I do mention, although it's a much shorter chapter now, thank you, line editor, um, <laughs> that um, a number of policy innovations that don't necessarily have to look like the IRCA legalization program in order to achieve many of the goals of the unauthorized population. Just remove the three and 10 year bars. Just include some sort of temporary worker program. Just there was a 245i bill introduced uh, the other day. There are any number of technical innovations. So if the point really is it doesn't, it can't be another amnesty program as the IRCA included, I would say, yeah, there are lots of ways to skin that cat and lots of ways to achieve the goal of protecting uh, unauthorized people from deportation. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, that's a very good kickoff for asking Q's and A's. I would just close this section out by saying that what this really all points to, it seems to me, is what some of us have had to learn the hard way along the way, and that is that there are not just answers and problems like this that get solved. The real issue is how do you manage it? And you do the actions that you can when you can do it in order to manage it, and then if the system is working the way it should, you revisit and find other ways of managing it because these are huge, huge forces and um, um, one cannot expect a piece of legislation particularly to uh, uh, address all of, its, all of the permutations. Okay, Hans, tell us your name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Paul Donnelly. Uh, I started doing this stuff a year before you got here. Uh, I was working in the Senate for Senator Dodd when the Hesburgh Commission report arrived. Uh -huh. And I worked for the chair of the Immigration Subcommittee during the 1990 Act. Uh, and I was the communication chair for the Jordan Commission. So I've got lots and lots of recollections on this. I'm kind of struck skimming through the book really quickly, which I bought like 30 seconds ago, uh, and listening to you that um, we seem to have remembered everything but learned nothing. Uh, for 25 years at least, I've been telling people that you could take the Hesburgh Commission report with the sole exception that I don't believe it exists in digital form. It was actually typed, if anybody knows what typing is. Um, you could change a few dates, a few numbers, and you could publish it tomorrow. And it would be still as valid as it was in 1981. And I think there's a reason for that. There are a whole bunch of people in this country who don't want to stop illegal immigration, who are okay with more people who have fewer rights. And who, in fact, are rewarded professionally in various ways for that outcome. I don't think the 1986 Act was a success because most people who voted for it intended to stop illegal immigration. I don't think the 1996 Act was a success and I was in the room when they did it because most people who voted for it intended not for it to be the punitive and cruel bill that it was, although they knew that, but they really thought it was going to stop illegal immigration. It didn't. The 1990 Act was a success, but you've characterized it as kind of an afterthought. I think that probably hints a lot at what the problem is here. What exactly would success look like? You gonna answer that, or am I that the one I'm supposed to answer? Um, You know, the, the short answer is um, we live in a democracy and the American people ultimately decide. That's the evasive answer. Um, there was an honest answer where I actually began, there was a, an early reviewer asked the question, so why don't you provide the prescription for what success would look like? And I have two answers to that. One is, um, the immigration bill and the immigration policy that I would like to see, I don't think can pass the Congress. Um, and at some level, um, it's therefore, uh, you know, almost moot as a, as a, except as a scholarly exercise. Um, I, I would also say that, um, you know, I want to be, 
it's difficult for some of us sometimes, but a, a, a little bit humble about the current debate. If part of my message to advocates and reformers is you got to do visits, you got to talk to people, you got to understand where they're going, you under, have to understand their affairs, extramarital and otherwise. Um, you know, if you're not on the front lines hearing those things, meeting with members of Congress, reaching out to the opposition, <coughs> Um, meeting with the Chamber of Commerce, as we did so often, um, meeting with the growers, as we did so often. Um, I, I just don't think it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel, even though I'm somewhat involved in the debate, I, I don't believe I actually have the essential information uh, to be able to answer the question of what's the best policy that could be enacted right now. But like anybody else, I have opinions, but... Uh, they're not especially well informed, I don't think. I think for this one. Charles? Yeah, I just had, uh, Charles, that wait, was wait, fantastic. Just Thanks. I think everybody can hear me. Um, <laughs> I, that was just both of you, I mean, all of you, just incredible. I feel like I went back 40 years. Um, you did. I did, I did <laughs> literally. Um, one of the other trends that I think came out of IRCA um, that is still around, though fragmented in a lot of ways by global politics, is the emergence of the business community, <clears throat> excuse me, as a recognition on their part that they had some responsibility. They did eventually, they did vote for sanctions, they did back it up. If they hadn't, it wouldn't have passed. So the NAM and the Chamber and other organizations, the Business Roundtable, decided to back that up. And it's still around, that responsibility. And they do still weigh in. Now, it could be true that it doesn't matter, that still the, that companies want cheap labor, and that will always be, and the push-pull will always be. But there, things have changed out of the work that was done around that. And I see it still lasting. Right there. Lisa. Hi. Hi. I'm Lisa Roney. Um, I worked at INS. I'm almost embarrassed to say that now. Um, for 39 years, US, um, INS and USCIS. I mean, I just have a couple observations. One is that I think the three-legged stool now be, uh, needs to become a conventional stool to add legal immigration, which is a big piece of the issue. Um, I think that there was a certain naivete or belief that the two enforcement-related uh, legs of the stool in 86 were going to solve the problem, and therefore we'd never need another legalization program, which of course <coughs> was sort of silly. Um, and I would note, and I don't know who's sitting behind me, but once IRCA passed, quite truthfully, the investigations arm of INS really did not like employer sanctions. They didn't want to implement it because worksite enforcement was not sexy. Criminal investigation was a much bigger deal. And therefore, it never, for a lot of reasons, it probably wouldn't have, it couldn't have succeeded. But that's another reason that it, didn't succeed, still um, and still true, yes. Um, and the 1990 Act, I don't think was an afterthought. <coughs> I think it was always planned that they were going to deal with enforcement first and then legal immigration, which happened four years later. Uh, and the only other thing I'd say is that the piece we haven't mentioned in solving the issue is the Asensio Commission that was another one of the 1990 Act uh, commissions, I believe, not 86, I'm losing it, but um, is that dealing with the conditions in sending countries uh, is also very important at solving the problem. Yeah, I, I'm glad you remembered that. Um, this was a, an amendment to IRCA, um, originally sponsored by Representative Roy Ball, then later by Representative John Bryant, um, called the International Commission on Migration, I think. Um, and Moose and I had dinner last night, and one of the things he asked is, you know, what would you have done differently um, with uh, 
so with hindsight. And you know, honestly, I don't think we took that commission and forced the Congress to take that commission a little bit more seriously. Now, in in our own defense, we were kind of also trying to implement legalization. You know, we wanted to repeal employer sanctions um, and replace it with what we thought would be a much more um, sustainable regime. And to the gentleman's question earlier, you know, I get the, the frustration from those who, you know, put their heart and soul into an enforcement regime that doesn't seem to have worked. But, you know, Washington is kind of this weird place where if you are with the, Congress, the conventional wisdom and you're wrong, it's okay. But if you're against the conventional wisdom and you're right, you're kind of like a pariah. The Latino organizations were the one, among those who said employer sanctions would not work. And we said exactly why they would not work. And we proposed a regime of labor law enforcement. Actually, we supported border enforcement then, and I, we still do now. Um, and a number of other measures that we thought would be more effective in at least controlling the flow, which is what we we thought was the reasonable, rational standard, and not this magical, we'll pass employer sanctions and all you know unauthorized employment would disappear. We thought that was wrong. We thought that was silly. And to have been proven right, and then people say, well, why should we listen to you? And we say, well, because we were right. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I guess you get no reward for that. Wade, do you have your hand up? Yes. Uh, Charles, congratulations. It's a tremendous accomplishment. I'm Wade Henderson. I'm the immediate past president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. And I want to make one quick observation and then pose two quick questions. The quick observation is that you mentioned the Civil and Human Rights Coalition of the 80s being in support of the, uh, uh, the bill, of uh, the uh, uh, immigration bill of, of mid-80s, and that is true. Uh, they embraced, you know, it's a complicated issue, Indeed. and they embraced um, legalization for the vast number of people who were not legalized, and there were real concerns about employer sanctions, both by the labor community, by the African-American community, and others. The coalition of the 90s and the coalition today is in a very different place and strongly supports the idea of comprehensive reform and has been very active and helping to lead the effort. So just to add that bit of gloss Indeed. to the conversation. And then here are the two questions. First of all, it, it does seem that uh, since the passage of RCA, there has been a real understanding that without significant investment in countries like El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, the likelihood of reducing the number of people coming to the United States from those Central American countries uh, would not be effective. And yet today, we see the problem having become even more acute. Obviously, uh, the problem of narco crime in Central America and other uh, shortages have driven people into the United States. Why has there been no meaningful investment in an effort to try to curb the flow of people coming in? That's the first question. And then the second question relates to the issue of race, the sort of unspoken dynamic of a concern, particularly reflected in the current policy, about the browning of America, the cultural signals that are being sent. It was, after all, the declaration by the Census Bureau that uh, the majority Caucasian population would no longer exist as the majority at around 2050. It continues to sort of cast a shadow over meaningful reform today. And I'd like you to speak a bit about the issue of race as well. So, so I'll try and be brief. Um, on, the, on the issue of, of Central America, I would leave it to others who are far more expert on, on the substance. On the issue of race, to some extent, I, I went back into the debate and, and look, tried to look at the literature to, to um, almost make the case that race was much more prevalent in today's debate than it was back then. And I don't think that's actually true. Um, if you believe code words mean anything, almost every speech in Congress was filled with them. 
Um, Kika de la Garza from South Texas in the 1970s debate, and actually in the 1982, referred to wetbacks on the floor of the House of Representatives. Um, so I think it is more open. It is more, it is clearer. And um, I think it might have been Moose who reminded me that uh, when one of the experts in, in this field, Joyce Violet at the Congressional Research Service, was asked what were the kind of precipitating conditions that led to IRCA, uh, one of them was um, we were at the height of this massive inflow of Indo-Chinese from Southeast Asia. There was any, there was a significant increase of, of uh, in unauthorized migration. And then I think the other precipitating event that uh, uh, another political scientist called uh, the precipitating event for IRCA was the Cuban-Haitian boat lift. Uh, and it won the Cubans people were worried about. Um, and, and so I would just argue the issue of race was right in front of us all the time. We were just kind of like not so sensitive to it at the time. Um, so uh, let me stop there in Central America or? <clears throat> well, the Central American issue is so present now, and it has, it, it's, it's such a separate story that, that I think I'd rather use the final minute or two that we have to um, you know, finish off on, on, on these issues that you've been talking about. I mean, when you talk about, as you just did, about race and the ethnicity, I think you would include in that, uh, then and now. Do you want to just make some connections between, or, or could you make some connections, would you make some connections between IRCA, the legalization, the, the, the enactment of IRCA, and the growth of Latino power in this country? Because it is such a force today, and it is really broadened out the issue of race and of discrimination in a way that was different in the 80s. I mean, no matter what, the issue in the 80s was fundamentally um, a black-white, and now there is such a broader set of questions that surround ethnicity, race, and discrimination. Where, where would, all right, let me just be pointed in this way. Would the Latino, would, would, Latino political influence, influence at the ballot box, which is always talked about as, you know, the coming tipping point. It doesn't ever quite happen, but it's there. Um, and the, the, the influence of the Hispanic Caucus in the Congress, for instance, um, all of the things that you're much more familiar with than I, could that have happened, would that have happened had IRCA not been enacted? Uh, the, the, I, I think the answer is clearly no. Um, but it's also important, a, a, a big chunk of the book is dedicated towards speaking to the issue of race. Um, the growth of, the, of an organized, uh, extraordinarily well-funded um, anti-immigrant movement um, that at the time of the, I started writing the book, I said somewhat boldly, I thought, that had veto power within the GOP on immigration policy. By the time I was finishing writing the book, um, I was reading all these studies, including, and statements, including from longtime GOP operatives that were saying that white supremacy was the core identity of the Republican Party. Um, you know, I think uh, when it comes to these kinds of issues, they tend to be what some political scientists call thermostatic. They're almost um, self-balancing. So as Latinos and others gain more political power, people who don't like that also gain political power. Um, and in that sense, um, I, I, I do think there is a, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I also think, um, you know, people have said, well, things are so much more partisan now than they were then, and it's, it's a pretty selective memory um, right. in lots of ways. Um, so when Tip O'Neill first killed the bill, pulled the bill off the floor in 1983, um, he, his rationale was basically the Hester rule. It was like the majority of Democrats aren't for it, so I'm not going to put it on the floor. 
Um, and the difference was, I think in those days, there was a little bit more recognition that if you get attacked by 300 editorial boards as he was, he might consider you know, changing. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's democracy working. Um, and so I, I do think there is often an element of um, self-fulfilling prophecy, that if we just imagine futures where the, our democracy will not and will never work, then it's going to lock us into those positions that um, force us to fulfill that prophecy. Well, we've gone over, but gone over on an important topic that I hope whets your appetite for conversation among you all. Please join us at a reception downstairs. Take the elevator to L lobby, turn left, and we will feed you and give you libations. And we will do that by thanking Charles and Moose. But thank you all for coming. And congratulations. Thank you both.